thank you so much for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Well, to be available to participate at JCConf uh, one more time. I really would love to be in presence with you. Uh, Sally was not able to do it this year, but hopefully for the next time. Now, um, the session of today is, as, as the introduction said, is Maven Puzzles. Um, but yeah, at some point, I will ask you to take out your phones and participate on an online quiz. Um, and then we'll have time for questions. And if you feel that you have any questions at any time, uh, please uh, let, let the staff on the, on the, on the room to let, let them know and they can ask the question immediately and, and, and then we can figure out. So I'm going to share my screen so you can see the slides. Here we go. And uh, now I need to get this out of the way. And let's play. All right. So, my name is Andres Almaray, and I'm a Mexican living in Switzerland. And funny story, currently I'm streaming from my hotel room in Morocco. I've been here for another event called DevOx Morocco. And um, one of the things that I, precisely one of the things that I like to do is talk about interesting projects, uh, methodologies, and open source in general. So today I would like to talk to you about a few things that I have discovered about Maven and its dependency resolution mechanism. So one of the things that that we have to use or and in, in our daily basis are tools. And it's a good idea to know and to learn how we can make the most effective use of said tools. That way we can be more effective with our time and uh, be able to do more things and don't worry too much about the problems that happen on our daily basis. And specifically today. Uh, the Maven build tool happens to be one of the most popular ones uh, in the Java space. But this is the result of a survey that was conducted by the Sneak uh, company, uh, which are there into the security business. And that, as you can see, they ask with which one, uh, which is your build tool of choice. And 76% uh, of the people say we use Maven. Of course, there are others, right? As you can can see the different percentages. But Maven remains uh, the most used tool. Whether you like XML or not, well, that's still a fact. But here's another survey. And uh, by the way, you see those QR codes uh, that from, from time to time will appear on the slides. Uh, that will, if, if you scan that QR code, then you can go directly to the page and to the report that we're seeing. So in the case for uh, the JRevel, um, product they also they, they have a history of conducting surveys and they, they asked the same question uh, recently and we got 68 percent of people using maven in the case of JetBrains, they also run a yearly survey of all different things different questions that, that asked to the um to to respondents and in this case we got 72 percent so we, now we know we have between 65, 68, up to 76, almost 80, depending on who you ask. Maybe it's quite popular, no questions asked. And even if you don't use the project, even if you don't, don't, use, don't use it for building, you still use the POM file for resolving dependencies. I used to talk a lot about Gradle in the past, and even though I will use Gradle for building my projects, Whenever I needed to consume dependencies, I will still be consuming that POM file. So how we craft, how we write those POM files, it's very important. It's not just if we are using Maven as a build tool, it will also affect others that will consume our projects. And we will see in a moment uh, different scenarios for how we can solve um, uh, some issues with dependency resolution. And depending on how we solve them, that will affect our consumers. It's not easy for me to say, always do this or always do that. It depends on the scenario at hand, the type of project you're dealing with and how your consumers will look at your project that you have to select one or a different solution. Okay? So that's, that's basically uh, the Maven uh, my, my, in my pitch for why it's important to look at Maven 
And if you have not seen Maven before, if you are a student and you're just getting into the industry, well, let me tell you that Maven is very, very popular. It's chances are you're going to encounter it very, very soon. If you're a seasoned uh, developer, you have definitely have heard about Maven. You might have used it, or you're definitely using it on your daily basis. There are many things that we can see about Maven, but the, I think that at the core, you can think that Maven is a very simple execution engine and all the behavior that is provided by the build tool is actually delivered by plugins. Maven is an extensible tool. The basics of Maven are quite straightforward to grasp and then the next complexity comes in figuring out which plugin should be used for your build and how you can configure and, and make any changes or settings to that specific plugin. Okay, so I said I mentioned a couple of times that we're going to talk about dependencies, but not all dependencies are equal. Not everything that we look at dependencies are exactly in the same way. And we'll see that in a moment. Because it, I don't know if it has happened to you, but it has certainly happened to me that when I'm working on, on a medium-sized project and I have quite a good number of dependencies, uh, there's always one that will act strange or weird. And I, I try to fix that particular problem and eventually it's like, oh, I just cannot deal with this complexity. This thing is not working properly. I don't want to use Maven anymore. I hate it, blah, blah, blah. And then so, oh, that's why it's not working. And now I know how to fix it. So this, this the session today is going to, the idea is to throw some light into some of these problems so that the next time you might encounter yourself in a similar situation, then you will be armed with the knowledge to, to fix it in a more effective way. But first, um, how do we, well, let's get started from the beginning. How do we build a Maven-based project? So for those of you that say Maven clean install, yes, yeah, it kind of works. It's, it's kind of like a hammer where um, uh, you cannot go wrong when you invoke a Maven clean install and a freshly check out project. But let me say that it is a little bit of a, a blunt instrument. There are other options that you can choose. For example, you can use Maven Verify. And here, let me tell you, I'm going to go in a little bit of a rant, uh, but uh, there is a reason for this. So I said earlier, Maven is an execution engine. And it does so in a way that when it bootstraps the tool, it will follow a series of phases. This is known as the life cycle phases of Maven. Uh, one to the next, to the next, to the next, until it finishes the sequence. And for each one of these phases, plugins will react whenever there is a new phase coming into and, and perform some work. So we have names of some phases that are, are very well known. For example, there's compile, test, package, install, and deploy. And if you can see here at the top right of the, uh, of the screen, there is one phase called verify, which happens to be the one just before install. So what happens when we invoke a Maven clean install, we first go through the second life cycle that you see on the screen, which is just pre-clean, clean, and post-clean and then goes into the main line cycle, which starts in validate. This is where Maven reads the XML and makes sure that it's a valid XML file. It's not just semantically valid, it's just syntactically valid. And once that is true, then Maven reads the actual model object and constructs some uh, uh, in-memory objects and then performs the work and goes through all the different life cycle phases uh, uh, because you win bug install, it will go through compile and all the intermediate ones and test, package, integration test, verify, and then install. The job of install is just to copy the artifacts that we just created, so the jar files and POM files or any seeds of anything that is attached to the reactor and push it to a Maven repository. In this case, it's Maven local, so your local file system. But verify, its job is to make sure that everything else has been invoked plus any integration test cases. So if we need just to build a project, Verify will do the trick. We don't need to push those artifacts to Maven local just to make sure that everything works. There may be some test cases that are 
there are some scenarios where you definitely need to push those artifacts to a Maven local. Say you have two projects that are completely unrelated to one another, and one of them consumes the second. In many cases, what we do is maybe install on the first and then just run build, test, package, or even install on the second because we want to build. Yes, this is valid. But if these two projects were to exist as part of the same multi project build by putting a POM aggregator in the center or the root, then we don't need to do install. We can do verify, and these two projects will be part of the same multi project build. This is a little bit of an advanced topic, but I'm just like to say that. Before the next time that you do, you want to build your project and say, oh, maybe in clean install, think for a moment if maybe verify would do the work. All right, so let's talk about dependencies. Maybe resolves dependencies in a graph. And each one of these nodes here represents one dependency. And there will be times when you have the same dependency, and by the same dependency, I mean the same group ID and artifact ID, but maybe it's a different version within the graph. So that will be the, the red dots. Maybe there is the same version. Maybe there are different versions. What is important here is that the distance from the root, if you look at the, uh, the top of the tree, that is the beginning of your POM file, and then we start to see uh, the different branches of how those dependencies go through. And we have these two red dots at different distances. One is at two, uh, it's like a second level, and the other is the third level. Now, the, the distance of dependencies it's quite important. And we're gonna see that in just a moment. So now we're gonna jump into the questionnaire. So here's the moment that I encourage you to, a, to pick up your phones and I'm going to show the next thing. So let's do the presentation here. Here we go. So pick up your phones, uh, please, and uh, scan that particular QR code. And that will take you to an online quiz, uh, Mentimeter. And we also have that, a, that access code in case that for some reason the, the QR code doesn't work for you. And uh, we'll start with a very simple set of questions. And then we'll jump into the dependency questions. And uh, let's see how we do. I just want to say that the first time that, that my wife and I, had this, we, have, we do this session in, in, in conjunction, the first time that we did it a couple of weeks ago in, in Milan, we had one of the Apache core committers in the audience, and, and we got him with a couple of questions. So they're not necessarily that tricky. It's just that we, we kind of have certain expectations on, on the behavior of Maven, and it turns out that Maven might behave a little bit different. Okay, so I hope that everybody has had time to, to go into Mentimeter. And I hear, I see some uh, hearts coming through. Thank you so much. Uh, so here we go. All right. So first question, how do you install Maven? There are many ways to get the tool into your system. So here I'm just gonna see um, how we do it. So far, uh, manually is winning over. Yay, we got the first person saying SDK man. Perfect, thank you so much. That is my personal preference, by the way. And uh, so I just wanna say a few things about this. So when you install manually, that's, that's just like the, the regular way to do it. You just find the zip file whenever it is, is available and uh, download it, configure uh, your environmental variables, whether you're Windows, Linux, or Mac, and uh, upgrade or downgrade for any other versions. In the case of Homebrew, that's a one step uh, ahead into automation, the big cut Homebrew knows where to find the zip file and configure the environmental variables, except that I believe that Homebrew will only let you install a single version across your whole, your whole system. Whereas SDK Man, which is also a package manager, you can install multiple versions of Maven and switch within one another without having to reinstall a previous version. So it's a little bit easier in this case if for whatever reason you need to switch within different versions. But as it came out in Homebrew, we allow you to install not just Maven, but other tools. So as long as you're using a package manager, and there are others, of course, I just wanted to put four options here, uh, I would certainly recommend you to, to automate as much as you can uh, installation and provision of tools. All right, 
next question. Uh, if I can go into the next one, here we go. What version of Maven do you use? The latest version of Maven right now is version 3.8.6. Uh, version 3.8.5 had an issue with resolving HTTPS resources. So please do not use 3.8.5. That's what I didn't list it here. And 3.8.4 and 3.6.3 might be the most common ones. I see some people using all their versions of Maven. Uh, that's kind of okay, but I will certainly recommend you to upgrade as soon as you can to the latest versions, specifically 3.8.6. The reason being that, of course, there have been many fixes that have been done through Maven uh, since uh, 3.8.6.3 came out, like almost three years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And there are also security patches. So if your company has been hit by, I don't know, some supply security, uh, supply chain attack, or some other issues, certainly please upgrade as soon as you can to version 3.8.6. This is, this is definitely much more secure than the other versions. Next one. Do you use the Maven wrapper? I guess I should have asked first, do you know what the Maven wrapper is? Oh, perfect. We got some people using Maven wrapper. I mean, I, I suspect that this question will go and leave it in a split. So the Maven wrapper is a script that allows you to bootstrap a specific version of Maven. So if you do not have, let's say, your project builds with 3.8.6, and you would like to, um, to say everybody should use that question, everybody should use that particular version, then um, how would you say that? Well, if you use the wrapper, the wrapper fix that version and you let people know instead of using Maven, use this tool called Maven W, the Maven script of, of the wrapper. And that will allow you to, um, to say that particular version of Maven goes with that project. And if Maven were not to be installed on your system, the wrapper will download it for you. So in this way, you can assert the project can be built with that particular version of Maven. All right? So next one, do you use the Maven daemon? So the Maven daemon is, is uh, oh, I want to say one more thing about the wrapper. The wrapper is now an official project from Maven, and uh, it will certainly be coming in Maven 4. So if you're not using it now, you're certainly going to be using it in the future. So the Maven daemon is a just another project that has been added or is currently in incubation for Maven. and. Um, the daemon allows you to launch the so every time that you run Maven right now without the daemon. What you do is you launch a VM and uh, invoke the tool that runs your build, and then the VM is gone. The next time you invoke Maven, you once again launch that Java VM, which takes some time to do the bootstrapping, invoke the, uh, your build, and then there you go. So it's a little bit of waste just throwing that VM every single time that we are no longer using it. So I would, the, what the Maven daemon does is keep that VM warm in the background process. So the next time you do an invocation of your build, it's going to be faster and faster and faster. So that's the good thing. All right. So here we go. Now we get ready to do some of the questions. OK? Excellent. So first question. Um, we're going to show the resolution of dependencies. And the resolution of dependencies will typically happen by invoking the following command, maven dependency tree. This is a dependency, uh, dependency plugin. And um, this dependency tree will display the graph as it has been resolved by maven. OK. So first question, you get a simple POM file like this one. And I know I'm going to use Guava as an example, just because, well, Guava is so prevalent, but uh, there are people that don't like Guava, like myself, there are others that they, they like to use it, and that's okay. So the problems that we're going to see here are not specific to Guava. They can occur with any of the dependencies. So we have two versions of Guava. 
and uh, we have version 27 and we have version 28. So the question now is, if I resolve dependencies here, which one is going to be the selected version? Is it going to be version 27? Is it going to be version 28? Or this might turn into a build error because we have duplicate dependencies. So how are we doing? Interesting. For, uh, a little bit more than 40% of you flag these as a build error. And you know what? I am with you. This is like a, a strange pwn file, but it turns out that the correct answer is version 28. What? How could that be? This, is, this should be clearly an error. But it turns out that Maven says no. It outputs a warning when you resolve the pen. It says anytime you use this pwn file, it will tell you, hold on a second, this pwn file doesn't look very good. But I will allow you to continue using this project. And by the way, the chosen version will be version 28 because this is an explicit version and is the last one that has been defined. So that's why this one wins. So when we're doing explicit dependencies or like this, direct dependencies, the last one that is defined is going to win. So remember that fact. Next, next question. Well, actually, let's go back to the slides and see why this is the case. So I'm going to play now this, go back here. So what's happening here? Well, we kind of like assume that uh, everybody knows what semantic versioning is. It's a specification of how we do versioning in our projects. Um, but it turns out that the tool, Maven, the way that it resolves dependencies, it has done it before even semantic versioning existed. So it turns out that Maven has no clue about semantic versioning. It doesn't use semantic versioning in any way. But there are ways that we can turn this warning into a proper error. So if you have not seen the Maven Enforcer plugin before, if there is only one thing that, that you can take away from this session, is please use the Maven Enforcer in your build. It's gonna break. And that's exactly what we want. Your build is slightly broken in one way or another, but we are not aware that there are some problems. And what the Enforcer plugin does is through a series of rules, bubble up those errors into proper errors so that we can see what's going on and then fix those issues. So the Enforcer plugin has a series of rules. And there has many of them. But specifically for us, uh, it's uh, the rule number four that we see from the top of the list, uh, ban duplicate pawn dependency versions. So when you go into your pawn file and add the, uh, and configure the enforcer plugin like this, and you add that rule, ban duplicate pawn dependency versions, and you run it, then that warning that Maven outputs at the beginning will now be turned into a proper error. So for about the 40% of you that said this should be an error, this is how you make it. This is how you make sure that that turns into an error. Okay, you go back into the quiz. Uh, where is it? Where is from the right? No? Uh, I lost the... Uh... Screen, hold on a second. I'm 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 doing something weird with my, my keys. Where are you from? Here we go. Yay, let's go back. Okay, next question. We have direct dependency on Quava. And now we have another dependency called Google Truth, which so happens to also have a dependency on Quava. So from the point of view of our POM file, which is base POM file, we have Guava as a direct transitive and um, Guava as a direct dependency. So the version of Guava that Truth brings is, I think is 30.1.1 Android. So given this POM file, when we resolve dependencies, which version of Guava is going to be chosen? Is it going to be version 28? Or is it going to be version 30? Or this might turn into a build error. All right. So, how are we doing? 
think I showed you the answer earlier. But we have a little bit of a split. Let me tell you that this doesn't turn out to be a little error. Uh, this actually works. We will get an answer. And that if you said version 30, there might be two reasons for version 30. Either because 30 is bigger than 28, so we're following semantic versioning, or because uh, truth is the last dependency that was defined in the POM file, so that should be the version that is resolved. But it so happens that the chosen version is version 28. So remember about the position of the dependencies in the graph? Well, this is kind of the reason. That version 28 is a direct dependency. It's closer in the graph to my POM file than the Guava version that is coming from Truth. That one is one more hop away, one hop in the distance to come to uh, closer to my POM file. So version 28 is the chosen one. Now let's back, go back into the slides and see why this is the case. Again, one more time, uh, semantic versioning, uh, we assume that the tool is aware of this, but it, it is not. So a couple of years ago, and you can see the date, it was in March 26 of 2020, uh, I asked this question and, uh, on Twitter, and Robert Schulte, which at the time he was the leader of the Maven project, he answered, like, like as you can see in the screen, Maven never looks at the version. It only cares about the position of the dependency within the graph. And whichever is closest, nearest to your POM file, to your definitions, is the one that is going to win. Huh. So is there anything that we can do to, to tell Maven, please make use of, the pen of, of semantic version? Certainly. We have two rules in the enforcer plugin, and this is why I say, please make use of the enforcer plugin. The first one is called dependency conversion. So if at any point in time in the graph, there happen to be a similar dependency, so same group ID, same artifact ID, but different versions, then this rule will trigger and say, look, you have version 30 and version 28 of the same dependency. This might be a problem. So I'm going to fail right now so you can fix that. You get this error when we activate uh, this rule. So we currently see that Guava version 27 has um, and, and 30 are different, but this we also doing the transitive dependencies within Guava and everything else that's coming from Truth. We see that it's not just Guava, but it's this Chickers, uh, Chicker Qual and error prone annotations that also have different versions as we build these two different transitive uh, dependency graphs. So by choosing one version of Guava, and perhaps by forcing one version of checker cloud or a rule from annotations, we will be able to fix any potential problems in our build. The other one that we can, the other rule that we can use is called required upper bound devs. And this is the one that activates semantic versioning checks. So with this, we're instructed maybe that if encounters different versions of the same dependency, it should prefer the higher, but because we have different ones, it might also fail. So this is the answer that we get when we activate the required upper bound depths. In our current example, we say we have version 27 and version 30. And uh, that's kind of a problem. It says version 27 might have been version 28 when I put out this error. And that's the one that is explicitly defined. But version 30 is coming up for a transitive graph. So um, depending on your use case, you might want to use a lower version or the highest version. It's up to you to decide which version you pick, but at least the rule is telling you, look, there is a potential problem in your dependency graph. Let's make sure that you are aware with this particular problem, and then you decide how you can fix it. Okay, we go back to the questionnaire. So I need to figure out how we do that. Okay, here we go. All right, question number three. We have this bomb file. And we introduce our friend, the dependency management block. If you have not seen this block before, let me tell you this works like a, like a lookup table. Whenever Maven encounters anything that matches within that dependency management block via group ID, artifact ID, 
then the chosen version should be what we specified there. So in this case, it's version 27, okay? So we have this pom file with that dependency management block saying version 27, and we know for a fact that truth brings Guava 30. So when we run dependency management, which is going to be the selected version? Is it going to be version 27? Is it going to be version 30 from, from the transitive? Or for some odd chance, it might turn into an error. All right, looks like uh, we have a little bit of a split. And uh, wow, build error? No, hold on, hold on guys. No, no, I, I <laughs> okay, I, I like your enthusiasm, but uh, I can guarantee you it actually works. All right, we're going, we're going, pretty good. Well, it so happens that the answer is version 27. Because, and this is one of the ways that we can force a specific version of a dependency through our dependence, our transitive dependency graph. So in this case, version 27 is the chosen one because we are not explicitly saying in, in, in our POM file, we want to use version 30. That is coming from the transitives. And when Maven encounters that you want to use a version of Guava somewhere in your transitive graph, it looks into that dependency management block, finds a match for group ID, artifact ID, and says, oh, I'm going to use version 27. Okay. Next one. We have our dependency management friend once again. So this is the same example as before with one minor adjustment. We now have a direct dependency also in the mix, version 28. So here we have some choices. Either it's going to be version 27 from dependency management, it's either going to be version 28 because it's direct, or it's going to be version 30 because it's a transitive. So, how are we doing? Got a few people answering 27 because of dependency management. Some others saying it's going to be 28 because it's direct. And given that we know that direct dependencies win over transitives, and no one should be chosen version 30, thank you. But from the previous example, we saw that dependency management was winning. Uh, so here we have the question, who's going to win? Is it going to be the one from dependency management? Or is it going to be the one that is direct? And I'm happy to see that most of you have selected version 28. And this is correct. Because once again, if we look at what is closest, what is nearest, to your POM file is going to win. In this case, the direct dependency wins over the transitive ones. There's one thing though, if we were to remove the explicit version number from line 25, if we were to remove version 28, then the chosen version for all of this will be 27 because that is, that is what is defined in the dependency management block. So the main, that block does not override explicit definitions of versions that we should uh, uh, remember that for the next questions. Okay, so here we go. Now we're going to add two dependencies that bring Guava as a transitive one, Juice that brings Guava 31 GRE, and Truth that we know brings 31 1 Android. And it so happens that both of these dependencies, both of these Guavas are at the same distance. So the fact that they're at the same distance is quite important. Different versions, but same distance. Okay. So we have this pom file. Uh, we define these two dependencies and we resolve. So what's going to happen? Who's going to win? Is it going to be version 30 GRE coming from Juice? Or is it going to be 311 Android coming from Truth? Let's cast your votes. How are we looking? Version 311 Android. Perhaps because that is the latest dependency that we define, right? Because we know that if we're not using Enforcer, then semantic versioning doesn't work in this case. And I think that most of you may be selecting 31.1 Android because exactly what I just said is the last one that was defined in the POM file. Because that's what we saw when in the first example, the last explicit dependency, direct dependency, won that time. Well, in this case, the chosen answer is 30 because we're dealing with transitive dependencies and the first one that is found, even at the same distance, is chosen. 
So this is very important. And this is one of the things that, why, why is Maven doing this thing? If it's direct dependency, last one wins. If it's transitive dependency, the first one that is closest is going to win. Okay. Next one. We have these two transitive dependencies and we add our friend, the dependency management block. So now we have three versions, possibilities, 28, 30 JRE or 31.1 Android. So who is going to win? Okay. We got a few answers on version 28 because it's coming from dependency management. So that's pretty good. And anyone for 30s? 30 JRE or 31.1? No? Perfect. Well, let me say that the chosen answer is correct. It's the version that is coming from the dependency management because we are not explicitly saying which other versions of Guava are coming from the transitive graph. So whichever is chosen in the, or explicitly defined in the dependency management block is going to win. So 93% of you were correct in this case. Now, we are only dealing with single pawn files. Now we're going to add a parent-child relationship and we'll see how the dynamic change. We have four questions to go on parents and then we have four other questions to go. And this is, will be the end of the quiz. So we're doing so, so far so good. Thanks so much for participating. So here we go. We have a parent file on the left and a child pawn on the right. The parent says, I'm going to supply version uh, 28 of Guava. The child, we can appreciate that in lines 7 to 11, defines that pawn file as a parent. And it also has an explicit dependency to Google Truth, which we know is going to bring uh, uh, Guava as a transitive dependency. So when we resolve dependencies, what happens here? Is it going to be the version for the parent? Or is it going to be the version from the child? So let's look at how we do. So far, most of the answers are going into version 28. And I'm happy to say that that is the correct answer. What's going on? When Maven uh, reads your, this, these two POM files, it goes through uh, the POM hierarchy or the parent hierarchy. So it first reads your child POM file, which is uh, base, and it detects that it has a parent. So it stops parsing here and goes and finds the parent POM file and reads its information and it detects that it doesn't have any parent, but every single POM file in Maven has a, at least one parent and that one parent will be the Maven Super POM. So it stops here and goes and reads what is known as the Maven Super POM, which is the one that provides the default plugins and that's how we can compile and do Javadoc without having to specify anything in our POM files. And then once it has reached the end of the hierarchy, it will come back all the way to the child by calculating what is known as the effective POM. So it grabs everything from the Maven Super POM and puts it into this effective POM. So let's think this right here, goes back into the parent and grabs everything that the parent has defined, such as that explicit dependency, and puts it into the effective POM. And then goes into the child and reads what is found there in the child and puts that transitive dependency. So in the effective POM, we have a direct and a transitive dependency. We have seen this example before. Who wins? The direct dependency. And that's why the chosen version is version 28, which is direct. So 85% of you were correct on this one. Let's change now this. Uh, let's add a dependency management block on the parent file. This is the only change that we're doing. So when we resolve dependencies, who is going to win? Is the dependency management because it's 26? The direct dependency on the parent because it's version 28? Or 30, which is the transitive dependency coming from the child? Let's see it. Some people are choosing version 26 because it's coming from dependency management. Some others are choosing uh, 28 because it's direct. And I'm happy to see that no one is choosing transitive dependencies. That's correct. It must be one of the two versions that we're defining in the parent. 
But as we knew before, as we have seen, when you have a direct dependency somewhere in your graph, that's going to override whatever is defined in the dependency management block. So the direct dependency found in the parent is going to be the chosen one. So 85% 85, 85 of you chose correctly. Next one. We only have, um, thank you. We only have a direct dependency, uh, 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 we have a dependency management block in the parent and a transitive dependency on the child. So it's either version 26 or version 30. Who's gonna win? I think this, this uh, we, should, we should get a clear answer on this one. Okay. We got a few people selecting version 30, which I mean, that, that's a good guess at the beginning. But in this case, once again, the version from dependency management block wins because if we go through the evaluation, the order of evaluation of the effective pump, this is as if the dependency management block was defined on the child. When you look at the effective pump, we got dependency management block and truth as a transitive. We have seen this example before because the version of Guava is not explicit. Whatever is found in the dependency management block is going to win. So that is why version 26 is the chosen one. All right, last example here. We got a dependency management block on the parent and a dependency management block on the child. Those are transitive dependencies. So who's going to win? It's going to be 26 from the parent, 28 from the child, or version 30 from the child. Version 26 is from the parent. 33% of you are going like, okay. And... Uh, version 28 from the child. Interesting, interesting split. Because so happens that the chosen version is going to be 28. Because when we remember that order of resolution of the chain, uh, in the effective pump, we find first the dependency management block from the parent. And then when we read the information from the child, that dependency management block is going to override what we have copied already. So version 28 is the chosen one. Now we got into the last four examples. And uh, I'm going to go a little bit quickly because we are running out of time. And we're going to talk about something that's called the BOM files. A BOM file is a collection of dependencies. And the most important aspect of a BOM file is the dependency management block. So on the left side, we have a very trivial BOM file that only has one dependency. On the right side, we have a consumer pump, so just any regular pump, that imports the BOM file. The name could be anything you want to. It's just the fact that a BOM file has a dependency management block. Okay. So when we have table resolution here, we can have three choices. It's either version 28 from the BOM, or it's version 30 Android from Truth, or version 30 JRE from Juice. So which one is going to be the chosen one? Uh, so far, we got one answer. Uh, one choice here selected is version 28. And, and if you have not used explicitly BOM files, let me tell you, if you're using a Spring Boot, Micronaut, Quarkus, Helidon, JUnit, Jackson, you're already making use of BOM files. And um, most of you have selected the correct answer. Because when we import a BOM file, we, it is as if that dependency management block from the BOM were to be written or copied over into our child. And we know for a fact that the dependency management block will dictate which versions we want to use in our transitive graph. So we have seen this before, and that's why it's version 28 is the winning version. All right, we're almost there. Three more things to go. Let's add one explicit dependency on a bomb, and let's do the importing. So who's gonna win? The one in the dependency management, the one that is direct, or the one that is transitive? So it's either version 26, version 28, or the transitive one. Uh, so far, chosen is version 28. Only a few have chosen version 26. And I suppose no one will choose version 30, which is correct. Well, let me guess. Let me show you that 8% of you are correct. Because this is the difference with bomb files and parents. When you import a bomb file, it's only the dependency margin block that is read. Whatever else is found in the bomb is completely hidden. So that direct dependency that we have in the bomb does not exist from the point of view of the child. 
So that's why version 26 is the chosen one. Now we add a dependency minus a direct dependency on the after we import the bomb file on the child. So who's going to win? Version from the bomb, the direct dependency in the dependency management block, or the transitive one? 26 it's, it's in the child, 28 is in the bomb. So who wins? We have a little bit of design on this, whether it's going to be one or the other. Well, let me tell you that the one that's going to win over is 26. Why? It's not because it's direct. It's because it's explicitly defined in the Maven dependency management block. So we can put it one before or after. Yeah, time's up. So I got just one more question and we're done. What we're going to add now is a direct dependency on the child. And if you look at, I hope that I didn't show the answers. Yes, oh, don't show the answer correct. Who wins over? Is it going to be dependency management blocks? Is it going to be direct? And I kind of like to give it away. It's going to be the direct one again because direct is closest. Perfect. So thank you for, so much for participating. I just want to close down very quickly because we got another speaker coming up. So first thing first, let's use semantic version as much as we can. And we know that we can instruct Maven to use dependency, uh, uh, different versions with dependencies and semantic versioning if we apply the Maven enforcer. There are many rules that we can apply. There are many other things that we can see, but at the very least, ban duplicate versions, do dependency convergence, and do uh, also require upper bound dependencies. Be kind to your, follow, to your fellow developers. So the examples that we saw today are real life examples. This happens on real life. Many people copy over solutions for Stack Overflow without exactly knowing the consequences. So how we fix the problems that we saw today will affect those that will consume your projects. There are other things that we can see. There are other options and problems that have happened in Maven and resolving dependency health. So Ray Sank has a series of, of has a slide and video that he did a presentation before where that he goes through these, some of these problems that we see today and some others and some solutions how we can solve it. So highly recommended to have a look at what Ray has said before. So with this, I thank you very much. I ran out of time, but if you have any questions, uh, you can follow it up on Twitter. You can also find me on GitHub. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Once again, let me, let me repeat that we're really, really happy to be with you in, uh, in person, hopefully some other opportunity. So thank you so much.